Our first project is going to be centered around the theme of color. As you can imagine, color and color mixing is a very important part of painting. But what is color? How many of you have seen a prism at work before? I'm sure a few of you have seen traditional prism, where it's a, a piece of glass that white light comes down through and breaks apart into all of the visible spectrum. I'm sure all of us has at least seen a naturally occurring version of the prism, which is a rainbow, where white light hits the raindrop. The white light, when it hits the raindrop, is broken apart into all of the visible spectrum. Now, everything we look at has color. Uh, and we only are able to see color through light, white light. So when white light comes down, hits, for example, a blue shirt that you're wearing, every color but the color blue is absorbed into that shirt and the blue light reflects back to your eye so you're able to see. We mentioned before, color is what we would consider a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's that visible radiation or the visible spectrum in which we see all colors. You can sort of see all colors of the rainbow there. But even outside of that is uh, infrared and ultraviolet radiation. So there's even more uh, visible, or there's even more to the light spe electromagnetic spectrum than what we can see. So that was the scientific explanation of color. But how do artists use color? This is a work by Joseph Albers. He was an artist and educator, and he was really interested in how we perceive color. This is one of his studies on squares. Uh, and one of the things he was really interested in is how color changes our perception. Uh, it changes our perception of uh, even how we perceive size. So what he would do, he would take multicolored uh, different squares make them the exact same size, but just slightly alter the color and put them next to them. So you notice on here, some of these boxes, even though they're the same size, the inside squares will seem slightly different sizes. Or oftentimes you put the same color next to each other and a different color on the outside, and that would actually change the way, the, the size of that box or change the look of the inside color. So what I want to talk first about today is what's called the color wheel. I'm sure some of you have done color wheels before. I'm going to still ask that you do it again for this project because most of you are starting a new material and the color wheel is really helpful in understanding you or helping you to understand how to mix color. So this is a color wheel. There are 12 steps to the color wheel. And a pure color wheel consists of what we call 12 hues. Hue is pure color on the color wheel. So you can see the 12 steps right there. One big part of the color wheel is what we call primary colors. Primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And as you can see on the color wheel, they're evenly spaced. So you have red, skip three spaces, yellow, skip three spaces, blue, skip three spaces and all the way back around to red. That's important to remember. Another color that we have is what's called a secondary color. So secondary colors are when you mix red and yellow together, you get orange. Yellow and blue together, you get green. Red and blue, you get purple or violet. If you notice, those are perfectly spaced in between those primary colors on the color wheel. And last we have the tertiary colors. Oops. The tertiary colors are those that are very last in between. So you have uh, red and orange mix red orange, orange and yellow mix yellow orange, Yellow and green mix yellow green, green and blue mix blue green, blue and violet mix blue violet, violet and red mix red violet. 
There's also another way that you can change color, and that's through something called value. This brings us back to that idea of light. Now, when we think about light, you know, that white light coming down from the sun or other sources, when you have a lot of white light, things tend to be lighter in value. As you get less and less light, they tend to be darker in value. And that's true for colors, too. If you're in a dark room, that red is not going to look the same as if you're in a nice, bright light. So as part of our color wheel, we're going to look at value, too. And one way to change the value is through tint. Any of those hues in the color wheel plus white is called a tint. So on your color wheel, you're going to do each hue plus tint, one of the circles around the inside or outside. We're also going to have a shade of each color and a sh or, or sorry, a shade of each hue. A hue plus black is what is called a shade. So you will also have a circle on your color wheel that is uh, left there for shade. Another way the color, the, to have the color wheel is to organize your colors. Um, one way to organize the colors is to think about them in color schemes. So we're going to go through a few different ones of those right now. Colors on the opposite side of the color wheel from each other are called complementary colors. Complementary kind of colors are kind of the opposite of what you think. For example, red and green are two complementary colors. Now, when they're across from each other, they actually tend to clash. But clashing colors means that they're making each other look more vibrant. So they complement each other by making them look more vibrant. Um, they can be, you know, this can be used in a way to make them see um, sort of full saturation, exciting. I want you to think about this too, because you're going to have to pick a color scheme for your first project. And um, you're going to base your color scheme on your personality. So if you have a very sort of exciting full force kind of personality, you might pick a complementary color scheme. Then here's an example of complementary color scheme by Mark Rothko. Next type of color scheme we're going to talk about is analogous. Analogous is a color scheme where all the colors are right next to each other on the color wheel. They match well, they create sort of serene, comfortable designs, they're considered harmonious and pleasing to the eye. If you consider yourself sort of a calm person, even keel, you might consider an analogous color scheme. So there's an example of an analogous color scheme by Martha Rothko. Next color scheme we're going to look at is triadic. A triadic color scheme uses colors that are evenly spaced around the color wheel. So, for example, the primary colors are evenly spaced, right? Those three spaces apart. So primary, good example of a triadic color wheel. Also, the secondary colors would be considered a, a triadic color wheel. Any of the um, tertiary colors would also be considered a triadic color wheel. So triadic color harmonies tend to be vibrant. Um, even if you use pale or unsaturated versions, they're considered balanced at the same time. So if you're a very strong, balanced kind of personality, this might be something you consider using for your color scheme. So here's an example of Piet Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Ugly with that triadic color scheme. Split complementary is another type of color scheme. And the split com complementary color scheme tends to be, it tends to have that balance that the triadic does, but it's got that little kind of unexpected pop, that little bit of clash happening. So an example of a split complementary color scheme would be green plus, not red, but red, violet, and red, orange. So here's an example of a Joseph Albers uh, split complementary color scheme. Uh, Rectangular or tetrad, oh, sorry, tetradic is a color scheme that is considered a very rich color scheme. It, it is um, one that has sort of a depth of color, so it's not quite as evenly balanced as triadic, 
uh, still allowing those colors to enrich each other. It uh, considers to have a lot of variation. So an example of a tetradic color scheme would be that we're using the opposites, blue and orange, but you'd be using um, blue, violet, uh, yellow, green, um, red, orange, and yellow, orange. So here's an example of a tetradic color scheme. Achromatic is another type of color scheme. You cannot choose this for your first project. Achromatic means without color. So you're not, not using any of those hues on the color scheme, just black and white. You have to have color for your first project. Uh, and also I will mention, because you're going to set it up a colored paper background, I would also say don't have a ground that's white. If you use white at all, use it very minimally. And I say that because white, when you're painting in color, uh, is never just pure white. There's all these other little tiny little hints of color in there that you want to try to mix in. That's actually a big challenge when you're learning how to paint, how to get that subtlety of color in there. So I'm going to suggest don't use white at all or minimally in the first project. Monochromatic is another type of color scheme. You can use versions of monochromatic, but I would suggest that you at least have two different hues from the color wheel. Monochromatic means a color plus its tints and shades. Tone is another way that you can change color. This is also going to be a part of your color wheel. And tone is a hue plus black and white, or a hue plus gray. So a lot of people when they're mixing will sometimes confuse a shade, like they'll mix up their tint and then they'll try to add black to the tint to get the shade. You have to start from a pure hue plus black to get a shade. If you did a, if you took a tint and added black to it, you'd actually get what's called a tone. So a tone is a hue plus gray. Saturation refers to the intensity of a color. And saturation is different from some of those other terms because we're actually sort of bringing the color down, not using black or white, but mixing it with another color. So as part of your color wheel, you're also gonna to have to do what's called an intensity chart. And in the intensity chart, you're gonna take each of those primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and you're gonna mix it with its complement. So you're going to mix yellow with purple, red with green, blue with orange. And you're going to mix a little bit of that uh, purple with the yellow until you get to brown in the middle. And then you're going to take a little bit of the yellow and mix it with the purple. So you're sort of working your way to the middle brown. Now you're never going to add, add so much purple that you make it all the way to the other side, you kind of have to mix those two colors separately. So you're going to mix your yellow, you're going to mix your purple, and then you're going to add uh, a various amounts to get to brown. So we talked about some of the, you know, how you mix colors, what the scientific meaning of color is, but what do colors mean? Do you think that color can have meaning? Well, that's something we're going to talk about next. What, what are some of the psychological meanings of color? So we'll look at a few examples. Here's an example that I think you've all seen, sort of walking down your basic uh, grocery store aisle. When you look at a fast food aisle, are there any common colors that stand out? You see a lot of primary colors, right? You see a lot of reds. You see a lot of yellows, you see a lot of blues, especially a lot of those reds and whites. Well, the way that color works in children's brains is children first see primary colors. Actually, just they first just see red and black. So we know that children are very attracted to primary colors. If you look, who do you think a lot of those uh, cereals are marketed towards, right? Kids, I know I'm that bad mom that does not let my daughter have a lot of those, you know, Lucky Charms, Reese's Puffs cereals. She's never actually tried them, but every time we go into the supermarket, 
she wants me to buy one of those cereals. Probably because she's just attracted to the packaging of it. I also notice there's a lot of green thrown in there. Why would you think green is a popular color for packaging? What do you think the meaning of it could be? Perhaps nature, natural. There they're trying to attract the, the parents, right? They're saying this is like natural, organic food that you want to eat. Has anybody seen these colors? What, what do you think they're trying to do with that mint green and light blue? Well, there have been studies done where they sat a gr you know, group of patients in different colored rooms and they take their blood pressure. Well, they discovered in the sort of light blue mint pastel rooms that patients actually tended to have lower blood pressure. And in brightly colored rooms like red or yellow, they had higher blood pressure. So you can imagine this is why they initially chose to paint hospital rooms these sort of lighter pastel colors. Though I will say, I feel like the opposite is true for me now. I see one of that mint green, it makes my blood pressure rise right away. What about red? What do you think the meaning of red is as a color? We can see a big variety of meanings here, right? So we've got the sports car, sort of like exciting, action oriented. We see it's used for stop signs because it's attention getting. Red is also seen as sort of seductive, right? Red is one of those colors that has a lot of strong, possibly different meanings to it. We can think about, you know, when we think about red, why do you think it has so many different reasons or different sort of psychological uh, meanings to it. Well, red is the color of our blood, right? So if somebody's injured or hurt, uh, red is the color that you'll see right away, so it's attention getting. Red is also associated with childbirth. So even though, you know, those red heels are meant to look seductive, they're probably thought that way because originally it was something that was associated with childbirth and having children. Black and white also have very strong meanings, although we'll talk about this later. Black and white actually have different meanings culturally, depending on uh, what culture you look at. So oftentimes, white is associated with good. Black is associated with evil. Um, you can Those meanings change depending on culture as well, but they tend to have those kind of polar opposites, right? White and black are on different sides. Or, you know, things aren't always black and white, sometimes people say. Uh, well, you can think about that because of how we talked about color, right? When we think about light, um, white light coming from the sun versus darkness. When we, do, when we don't see any light, it's black. We can't see anything. That's why a lot of those associations originally came from. example, do you see any common colors in these fast food signs? There was another scientific study done where they put people in a room with food and they measured in different, I mean, different colored rooms with food and they measured the amount of food that people ate in each of those different colored rooms. So can you guess which rooms people ate more food in? If you guessed red and yellow, they measured that people ate more food and ate it more quickly in rooms that were painted red and yellow. Blue is another common color used in advertising. Oftentimes blue is seen as being stable, trustworthy, stands the test of time. Often you'll see that's why car companies use it because you want to buy a car that's going to last a long time. Silver you can also think about in a similar way. Uh, on the left is Apple's original logo, which their theme was Think Differently. So they had that rainbow colored themes, all the possibilities. Later they went to the model of being sort of a luxury project product. They changed to silver, right? So we looked at a few different examples in advertising. We also are going to look at Diana Vandell's The Colors of Human Traits. So I want you to think about this. 
if you had to name your favorite colors or colors that could represent your personality. Um, this is not scientific at all, uh, but I want you to think about it because you're going to have to select some colors for your project. Um, what colors could represent you, represent you personally? So we have nurture blue, sensitive to the needs of others, sincere, expresses appreciation, cooperative, collaborative, creative, caring, team builder and player, people person, engages others, artistic, inspirational, spiritual, inclusive, mediator, peacemaker, idealistic, intuitive, romantic, loyal, seeks unity and harmony, caretaker. That's a nurture blue. Do any of you think you could be a nurture blue? And if you are, what color blue would that look like? Would it be a light blue, a deep blue? Something to think about. Adventurous orange. Just do it. Action oriented, quick witted, charming, spontaneous, playful, injects fun into work, lives here and now, risk taker, creative, enjoys diversity, variety, competition, multitasker, energetic, bold, quick thinking and acting, takes charge, high visibility performer, assess challenges, enjoys problem solving, negotiator, performs well under pressure, resilient. Are any of you adventurous orange? Traditional gold, respect, rules, and authority, routines, policy, faithful, dependable, prepared, efficient, remembers the traditions at work, family values, work comes before play, practical, systematic, orderly, identifies with groups, strives for a sense of security, thorough, sensible, proper, a right way to do everything, stick to itiveness, evaluates actions as right or wrong, stable, organized, punctual, helpful. Are any of you traditional gold? Visionary green looks forward and sees the impact of actions taken now, explores all the facets before deciding, checks for accuracy, careful planner, enlivened by work, status quo buster, designer of change, inventive, systematic, logical, theoretical, self-sufficient, often not in the mainstream, persistent, thorough, intellectual, inquisitive, impartial, and improvement oriented. Are any of you visionary green? Could you be all of these colors? Sure. Are there little bits and pieces that you could have? Absolutely. What, is there one green that defines this visionary green? No, there isn't. Do you think that, you know, but you can kind of think about it. If you're thinking about sort of personality traits that you would give yourself, try to find a color that you could associate that with and, and try to think if you could make your color still life out of those colors. So what are some cultural associations with color? We talked before about black and white. Um, oftentimes, uh, you see those as polar opposites. And depending on the culture, they can represent different things. For example, funerals in China use the color white. Western cultures commonly use black. White in Western culture will op often represent brides. Uh, other cultures much more commonly have very colorful bridal ceremonies. So you can think, you know, a lot of those things people sometimes think uh, colors represent something and it's inherent in the color isn't always true. It changes culture to culture. One good example of that are these two colors, pink and blue, right? From very young ages, we say girls wear pink, boys wear blue. Is there some reason that there's those particular colors that pink is feminine and blue is masculine? Did you know that it used to be flipped? That pink was considered masculine and blue was considered feminine? It wasn't until the 1950s that these became very solidly a part of commercial culture. So now it's kind of embedded in the things that we sell children. Uh, and one particular is deal with this idea that all these sort of industrial products and the colors that they're made in. If you can see, these are all a gathering of different pink products that the artist uh, Portia Munson has gathered together. Some of them are children's toys. Some are not quite so children's to toys, if you look carefully. Also, we have, you know, she she also places them together to kind of look at the idea of waste and how much of this plastic trash that we make. 
sometimes it's meant to be humorous, like green. Oftentimes we think of green as being about nature. These are a lot of times outdoor toys, but when you put them all together, they're just this big giant piece of garbage, right? Other times artists use colors for more emotional reasons. If you look at this piece, why do you think there's such a predominance of the color of red and yellow? If you know anything about the Northern Renaissance, you know they were very um, obsessed with the afterlife and representations of hell. This is meant to be hell itself. If you look towards the left-hand side, you'll notice there's a face with sort of a gaping hole in it and a you look really closely, you'll see a bunch of people being tortured, uh, hence sort of the red sky and fiery red sun. Sometimes artists will choose to flip the traditional meaning of a color uh, to create some irony or interest. For example, in this piece, we have those traditional blues that are often pastel blues that are seen with baby boys or fairy tales. But when you look at this color, it has a much darker, deeper scene to it. One of the artists that uh, chooses to do a lot of this is Toshigi Murakami. He's very interested in the idea of childhood. A lot of his work is described as being part of the little boy syndrome. Little Boy was the bomb that the United States dropped on Japan during World War II. And a lot of artists are interested in the idea of how that nuclear attack affected Japanese culture. And for a long time, Japan uh, had what they described as their big brother watching over them and deciding what they could do and couldn't do. Uh, anime is something that rose out of this. The idea that they could use a childlike format to tell uh, very deep emotional stories. So by hiding something in this sort of children's storytelling form, um, they could tell things that were otherwise difficult to tell. So um, as you can see, that's an example of that in this work. Is he's using sort of childlike cartoon imagery that's also very dark and scary. Pastel colors are a part of that. Okay, so for the first part of this project, you have to create a color wheel. You have to create a color wheel with 12 hues. You have to have 12 to fit them all in, right? The three primary, the three uh, secondary, and the six tertiary. And they all have to be in the correct order around the color wheel. Around the inside of the color wheel, you're going to create a tint of each hue. You only have to do one tint. They should look like they all have the about the same amount of white in it. As you'll see in the next video, you know, you're not going to just measure out the amount of white and add it to each color. You have to try to sort of manipulate it. Like you'll probably have to use a lot less white when you mix the yellow than when you will with the blue. So you have to kind of visually match the amount of white that is in each tint, not necessarily the amount of paint that you put with it. Around the outside of the wheel, you're going to create a shade of each color. And a, so a shade is each hue plus black. You're also going to create an intensity chart. So yellow to purple, red and green, blue and orange, and you're going to mix to the middle brown. So just to give you a couple examples here, um, these are some finished student projects. Uh, the next video is going to talk about this a little bit more. You're going to pick a variety of colors that you're going to make your um, your project about and you're going to create some three-dimensional color still lifes. You can use any kind of colored paper or fabric that you find around your house but they have to be three-dimensional. So make sure you watch the next video about it. We're going to make the still life and you're actually going to create a painting based off of that still life.